Today we will be presenting on the common mistakes made by foreigners investing in the United States. We'll start off with a quick disclaimer that this presentation is prepared for educational purposes only. This presentation is not legal or tax advice, nor should it be construed as such. Um, each individual circumstance is different, and you should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. Um, a little background about myself, um, I'm a tax consultant here at Esquire Group, we're an international tax advisory firm specializing on cross-border uh, U.S. taxation. I myself am an enrolled agent, I deal with uh, topics such as Americans living abroad, foreigners investing in the United States, um, foreign businesses doing business in the United States and vice versa. My full bio is available online um, as well as our full list of services and background of the company if you're curious. Um, so let's go ahead and get into today's topic. Um, we will be talking about 10, uh, or we've identified the top 10 mistakes which we find when foreigners are investing in the United States. So we'll just be listing off the, the top 10 and a little background as well as how to avoid them. So the first is failing to get a US tax and or legal advice before investing in the United States. Um, what do we mean by this? This is, means consulting a US tax expert or a, an attorney dealing with international issues. Um, it's very surprising how many foreigners invest in the US without seeking any type of uh, tax or legal advice. They often structure their investments in an unfavorable manner because they're unaware of the uh, implications of investing in the United States, be it tax or legal. Um, so when dealing with or if, if you're a first-time investor or you're doing business in the United States, it's always a good idea to get a uh, professional opinion and just to, to have someone look over what you're planning to make sure that uh, there's no negative consequences. So the second item we have identified is failing to get tax and or legal advice in their country of residence. So not only do you need to consider the implications on the U.S. side, you also need to consider the implications of the country where you reside um, or if the company is is based of so there would also be possible laws or uh, reporting obligations which exist on the home front um, so mo most countries do have certain laws requiring their residents to report um, and pay tax on foreign income most most countries do follow a a residency-based taxation system. So no matter where your income is from, um, if you're considered a tax resident of that country, it's most likely taxable or at least reportable in, in your home country. So this is an issue that varies country to country. Um, for example, we deal with the US side on, on taxation. So if you're, if you're a resident of Germany, for example, um, it's always a good idea to, to consult a expert regarding your home country laws and regulation to be fully aware of any reporting issues which um, you you want to avoid in order to remain compliant. Um, also not doing this can easily result in costly consequences um, as well as fines or, or general if you're doing something um, illegal or didn't pay tax on it, um, you're in for some trouble with the tax authorities. So always good to consult someone, um, especially an international expert who is familiar with cross-border situations. The number, the third item which we identified is getting U.S. tax and or legal advice from their local foreign tax advisor or lawyer. Um, you'd be surprised how many foreign investors in the U.S. ask their local advisors for U.S. tax and or legal advice. Um, to be frank, this is something which, which a foreign uh, tax advisors should should generally not be giving out. While there are some uh, individuals or firms which are qualified on giving advice or are familiar with the regulations regarding U.S. regulations as well as uh, the foreign side. So if, if you're dealing with like a Germany U.S. issue, you might be able to find someone which which is an expert in both sides. But in general, um, people are focused on on one side of the transaction. Myself, for example, I'm a U.S. tax advisor, I'm an enrolled agent, so I have to focus on the U.S. side. And I, I won't, nor should I be giving investment advice if someone's dealing on the Thailand side or Germany. Um, so, so a lot of tax professionals might give incorrect advice um, if, if it's something they're not uh, 
well rehearsed in or not familiar with. So it is important to check or at least be confident in whoever you're receiving uh, advice from that they are competent. It's something they're familiar with and that anything that they're they're telling you is is accurate. It, it is a common case that U.S. advisors would often give wrong tax advice or, or maybe consult on foreign rules when they really don't know anything about it. Main point here is be careful with who you're receiving advice from and, and make sure you're, you're selecting someone or at least using someone who is well-versed in, in that topic. The fourth issue which we identified is running afoul of the U.S. estate tax. Now, most individual investors have never considered or have never even heard of the U.S. estate tax. Um, so the estate tax applies when someone has passed away and their um, belongings or, or what's what they own um, goes into their estate, and then this is generally handed down to their heirs or whatever their will says. Um, so U.S. estate tax applies to U.S. real property, um, such as uh, houses, cars, boats, um, as well as securities of U.S. companies. So this is something that is generally forgotten and, and most people are unaware of. Um, securities of U.S. companies are treated differently for estate tax purposes than, than income tax or, or even gift tax. Um, so it is something to be aware of when, when dealing with estate tax. There is a $60,000 estate tax exclusion. This is essentially a tax-free chunk which you receive. Um, anything beyond this $60,000 would be taxed at a 40% rate. Um, and the amount which is taxed is based on the fair market value of the assets within the estate. So, for example, if we're talking about a $1 million estate, including of uh, U.S. securities, even if it's held in a foreign bank account, as long as they're U.S. securities, um, the estate tax would apply. So if we have $1 million minus the $60,000 exclusion, we would have $940,000 to which the tax would apply you would be in for a fairly large tax bill. The fifth item is not making an estate plan. Uh, many foreign investors falsely assume that their assets in the U.S. will pass to their heirs in the same manner that assets would in their home country. A lot of people think that just because they live in Germany, for example, that only that country's estate laws would apply. Um, so you'd need to look beyond that where the assets are actually located. Um, so if, if, if someone has a property in the United States, um, or, or owns U.S. stocks. Um, this is definitely something that needs to be considered and a plan should be made in order to avoid any excess tax or, or at least being shocked that, that it is applied, that it is applicable. This is not always the case. So if, if proper estate planning is implemented, um, you might be able to reduce your exposure to the U.S. estate tax and also ensure that assets are passed according to the wishes of the foreign investor. Um, in some countries where, for example, Sharia law applies, there might be discrepancies if, if a plan is not in place. Um, so, so in a proper estate plan um, ensures that, that everything is done to the wishes of the uh, person who has passed or the foreign investor in this case. The sixth issue, which I'll talk about, is being unaware of FERPTA. Uh, FERPTA is also known as the Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act of 1980. This is a withholding tax system. Um, so for foreign investors, in this case like a non-resident alien who is disposing of U.S. real property, is subject to 15% withholding on the amount realized from the disposition. Um, when we refer to a disposition, we're talking about transactions such as um, selling an asset, gifting it to another person, or making a con capital contribution to a business entity. The withholding is applicable regardless of if the property or that asset is sold at a profit or loss. So this is essentially a, a standard withholding regardless of the value or the gain to be recognized on it. It's essentially a system put in place to ensure that um, the foreigners aren't selling something and leave an open tax bill and that that tax bill never gets paid. So this is something that most foreign investors don't know about or are surprised about when they find out that part of the, the transaction would be withheld. Generally, the, the withholding agent 
who is generally the mediator of a transaction. So if you're selling a house, for example, the, the title company, which in between the transfer um, where the, the money exchanges hands, this is where the, the 15% would be withheld. So if you're selling a house, say at a million dollars, even if it was purchased for a million dollars, so no gain, um, $150,000 of that transaction amount would be withheld by the withholding agent and transferred to the IRS to cover any potential tax liability you may owe. And if this is none, um, you would have a right to reclaim it by filing a return and getting a refund, but something to consider when, when planning such a transaction. The seventh point is failing to apply for FERP to withholding certificates in a timely manner. Withholding certificates are a mechanism which can eliminate the withholding. If you're selling a property, for example, and you're planning for it in the future and you're aware that you're going to be selling it at a loss or, or a, say no, no, no gain at least, um, there would be no tax due because the, you would be taxed on the gain. The withholding certificate is something you receive from the IRS, which essentially says that you've provided documentation that you're not going to owe tax, so there's no need to withhold uh, the 15% or, or any amount. Um, the withholding certificate varies. It, it might be a different percentage or might be no withholdings at all. And then when, you, when you've when you applied for and if, if they accept your application and issue a withholding certificate, this would then be, be provided to the withholding agent and then they would, would either withhold that reduced amount or, or withhold no tax at all. So if you don't, don't plan and receive a withholding certificate, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of it and that, that standard 15% would be withheld. And it does, it does take time to, to receive the application process is not very speedy and you do have to go provide quite a bit of documentation to receive one. So if you're planning on doing a transaction, it's definitely something that should be planned as far as possible um, to ensure that you're not having uh, funds withheld for a the po it, it can be possible that they're held for a long time or require those funds to continue doing business, for example. Um, you can avoid that occurrence by, by taking advantage of the withholding certificate. The eighth item is failing to apply for a taxpayer identification number in a timely manner. Taxpayer identification number is essentially your account number when dealing with the Internal Revenue Service. For companies or entities, this is referred to as an EIN, an employer identification number. For individuals, it is an ITIN, an individual taxpayer identification number. For a US person, for example, it's referred to as your social security number. So this is something that a foreigner or a foreign company would not have by default. It is something you need to apply for and obtain. It is something that does take several months to get. So it is something that needs to be planned for in order to properly do things such as the withholding certificate or file a tax return. It is important to properly receive one if you're required to do so. Some of the occurrences which happen if you don't get one, for example, is that if there's no, if you don't have an ITIN or an EIN and with money is withheld, it can be difficult for the funds to properly be linked to your account later on if you try to claim a refund. So it, it, it is an important thing to have and, and does help with, with dealing with the IRS because it's essentially your, your account number. Without this, it's, it's hard to allocate funds to your account or you can't file a return already. So, so something to consider and to plan for. The ninth item which we identified is failing to report foreign investment in the United States with the Bureau of Economic Analysis. This is completely separate from the Internal Revenue Service. It has nothing to do with uh, income tax, nor is it a tax return. The Bureau of Economic Analysis has certain requirements for statistical purposes, which they require foreigners or foreign businesses that are doing business in the United States to report. It, a lot of the information is similar to a tax return. The most common information is you know, what type of business you're doing, how much revenue you generate, how many employees you have, items like this. It is something which can, or some, some tax preparation companies uh, do offer the service. So for example, we, we do this for a lot of our clients for which we prepare their tax returns. It is a very unknown form, as in a lot of people forget about it or are unaware of it. A very large number of people are very surprised when they find out about this. Um, even if they've been filing for a long time, um, a lot of people don't, don't think about it um, or just unaware, uneducated on it. 
Um, it is important to, to file it properly because there are penalties for failing to file and this can be quite high. Um, so in order to avoid those, you definitely want to timely file any, any reports which need to go to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The tenth and last item which we've identified is failing to make tax treaty claims. So a tax treaty, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, is essentially a contract or a treaty at least between two countries. In this case, we're talking about the United States, so it would be the U.S. and Germany or the U.K. or Australia, um, which have agreed on a specific terms relating to tax issues. So it's special treatment of certain types of income or how certain things are defined. It's essentially a, an additional set of rules, which would be an exception or overrule the normal, the default rules. And the U.S. does have a fairly extensive uh, network of these tax treaties, and it often gives residents of the other country, so we're talking about a Australia-US transaction and it's a resident of Australia, it does have the potential to provide beneficial tax treatment for the individual, sometimes does have a significant reduction in, in tax liability or a different tax rate. And this is something which needs to be considered when dealing with the tax issue. And it's not an automatic, you're not automatically treated under the tax treaty. It's something you need to claim. So if you're not making the claim under the tax treaty, um, you'd be treated under the, the standard regulations. So if we're talking about a tax return, for example, um, there's an additional form that would go with it saying you're claiming a tax treaty pursuant to Article X. Um, so, so it's something that can can be beneficial for for an individual when when dealing with a cross border issue. So these were the top ten items which we identified. If you have any specific questions or you saw an issue which you require more advice on, um, feel free to visit our website or schedule a consultation with us.